All right, if you're paying close attention to your syllabus, you might notice that um, this week's scheduled speaker um, is actually out of town, so I'm grateful for today's speaker for stepping up to fill in. Today's speaker is relatively new to the department as a postdoctoral research associate um, and a member of Dr. Vardeni's lab, and it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Evan LaFonso. Thank you very much for the introduction, and thank you all for being here and for your attention. As you just heard, I'm a new postdoctoral researcher for Dr. Vardini's group, and uh, he put together these slides. I was kind of a late addition to the program, um, so I haven't had too much time to prepare, so I apologize in advance if some of the transitions are a little rough. But the subject matter is something I know a lot about. I actually did my PhD dissertation on organic solar cells. And so I hope to be able to explain the material well and also to field any questions that you might have. Okay. So here's an outline. We'll first motivate the need for solar energy in general um, and describe the photovoltaic effect on a sort of a basic, as a basic principle. And then we we'll talk about how organics can function in this role and why we might want to be interested in those materials for solar cells and what the advantages are. Then I'll describe the uh, working principles of the organic solar cell, and we'll talk about how we make them, and some of the future outlook. So beginning with the need for solar power conversion, uh, it all starts with this, our beautiful Earth, uh, as seen from outer space. And I suppose a major theme of this talk, especially in view of the, the public eye, would be how do we keep this world so beautiful while still being able to provide the energy that uh, all the inhabitants of it need to cook their turkeys. Um, so here's another view. This is uh, Europe. Uh, mainly, well, Europe is what you can mainly see uh, because of the uh, distribution of light emission coming from our cities. Um, so this is what human beings do, right? We consume a lot of energy, and even the aliens know it, right? So this is the same thing, but the United States. And you can see these high concentrations of light coming from the metropolitan areas. Uh, this is where I'm from in Tampa, Florida. Uh, and you can see it's still daylight over on the west coast. And so basically we want to talk about how we can use this kind of light uh, to be able to provide our civilization with this kind of light, right? So we can pay for it. So there are lots of other kinds of energy needs as opposed to just lighting. Uh, and this figure shows uh, some of the different energy scales uh, and the different uses. So we use about a watt for our laptops, uh, kilowatt for toasters, megawatt range for, I guess, small airplanes probably. And uh, I was surprised to find that it only takes one million toasters to make a power plant. Um, but the, um, the overall power consumption is on the scale of uh, terawatts for, uh, for the entire Earth when we take all of these things into account. Um, so that's a lot of energy. Um, and the world population is not expected to get any smaller. Or it's expected to keep on growing, which means that demand is going to keep on growing. And probably more important than just the growth in the number of people that uh, are on this planet is the fact that uh, less industrialized nations are rapidly industrializing, right? So even if the population were to stay constant, we would still see a large growth in demand for energy because of this. My advisor, um, she came from a village in China. They didn't have electricity until I think she was uh, around 16 or 17. But I'm sure that's a lot different just, you know, 20 years later. Um, so where does all this energy come from? Well, you probably know the answer is almost all of it comes from carbon, right? Combustion of carbon-based fuels, or what we call fossil fuels. So you see 37% from oil, and then basically another quarter comes from coal or from natural gas. Uh, nuclear and things like hydroelectricity make rather small contributions, and then this tiny little sliver has to be magnified for you to see how much we're actually getting out of renewable energies uh, at the current time. Um, and so this brings us to kind of the first problem that we can address with solar energy, which is, uh, I think, commonly referred to as the looming energy crisis, right? So uh, as you see, most of the oil was discovered uh, basically last century. We pretty much know where it all is, and now we're just in the process of extracting it out of the earth and burning it all up. Um, and this energy demand, again, is expected to just keep on growing. 
Uh, and right now we're consuming uh, twice the amount that we're extracting. Um, and I think uh, forecasts say that we're basically at current rates are going to run out of oil in about 50 years. Um, meanwhile, if you look at the potential of these renewable energy sources, uh, and considering that the uh, annual energy consumption right now is about 15 terawatts a year, you see that many of these renewable energy sources have enough to provide us that energy. Uh, so these are all annual, right? So we can get 32, which is double what we need out of geothermal, uh, about 100 or so more than what we need at wind. But then you look at solar, and we can get 600 times what we need in a single year uh, that is deposited on the earth from the sun. So just a massive resource. Um, so you can imagine if we can just get relatively efficient at collecting, converting, uh, storing, and using this source of energy, then we're set and we don't have to worry about energy problems anymore. And also another striking number is if you take that forecast that we basically have about 50 years left of oil, um, this means that we basically have 100 times more energy deposited on the sun per year than the entire finite resource of carbon-based fuels on the earth. Um, so you can kind of look at this as a proposition. Uh, basically, we have a choice. We can either learn how to use this energy, or we can drastically adjust the way that we live our lives, right? Uh, it's just a matter of time. Because right now, this is us, right? So we're happily floating along. Uh, consuming energy towards our own demise. Uh, so we'll, we'll, we'll have to do something to change that. Um, so this is kind of the same thing, but viewed from a different light. Uh, so this shows you how much land area we would actually have to block out from the sun uh, in order to collect uh, relative amounts of energy um, that we consume. And so this is for a 10% efficient photovoltaic uh, device. So current uh, state-of-the-art technology can achieve somewhere around 25%, um, and the organic photovoltaics that I'll talk about have just reached this 10% uh, level. So this is more uh, for organic photovoltaics. But as you can see, this little dot will give you about half the energy consumption of France. Uh, the white square will give you half of what we need for Western Europe, uh, whereas the purple square can basically take about half of the, the world's annual energy consumption um, and so you see we don't really need to cover up that much land area in order to power the world with solar energy. Um, this slide I think kind of alludes to uh, another interesting characteristic of solar energy conversion though is um, what if you don't live in the desert, right? Because this is where we can collect a lot of energy but then ultimately have to be transported out to areas where they don't have as much sunlight which is another issue kind of down the road after we take care of the efficiency of the actual modules itself. So there's a lot of issues there. Those are more on the engineering side though, right? Uh, physicists sort of work on the, uh, the device side. Um, you might have also heard that we might not even get to that end of that finite resource before we start uh, seeing the consequences and, and really feeling the consequences of all this carbon consumption. Um, so uh, these are just striking images about the effects of the CO2 byproduct that we put in the atmosphere when we use up this kind of energy. Uh, so you can see how much ice we've lost in Greenland uh, and what this glacier used to look like as to compared to what it looks like now. So uh, we know that we're uh, rapidly changing our ecosystem, which uh, hurts you know, lots of biological species. And in one way or another, maybe in a nonlinear, indirect way, but we all kind of rely on these ecosystems, right? Um, so this is, uh, as opposed to the looming energy crisis, the, uh, the global, global climate crisis that we're also running into. Right? So we basically have two major motivations to go towards uh, solar or other renewable energy. But again, because of the potential of solar, uh, that's probably uh, the, the best way to go. So then you might ask, well, you know, if we have this much energy around uh, and there's all these problems associated with burning up fossil fuels, why aren't we doing it now? And the uh, reason is cost. Um, so you can see here, basically costs about 3.5 kilowatts for crystalline uh, silicon solar cells, which are kind of that state of the art 25% that I was talking about. And the reason that can be so expensive is because they have to be single crystal. Uh, that's a very expensive process to make. It requires high temperatures, uh, low pressures, lots of time. So it's a very expensive process. Uh, the cost can be reduced by 
basically uh, sacrificing some of that high crystallinity and therefore that efficiency. And basically, this is what, I guess, you know, from an entrepreneurial standpoint, uh, or maybe from an con energy consumer standpoint, this is the efficiency that people really care about, right? The 25% that I mentioned is power conversion. So the amount of power the sun delivers to the device, my, uh, the ratio of the power we get out of the device to the power that's delivered by the sun. But this is another kind of efficiency that's sort of more important to the public. Uh, how much does it cost to get a kilowatt hour, right? So as you can see, it's about two or uh, three dollars for current uh, solar cell technology, as compared to about six cents uh, from natural gas. Um, so it costs what um, thirty times to you know fifty times more to use solar energy than it costs to use natural gas. That's why we use these fossil fuels right now, right? It's all about money. So one of the reasons that will motivate organic solar cells is because they have the potential to drastically bring down this cost. Because we're now we're going to be dealing with low weight organic materials um, and uh, they don't have all these associated costs with trying to grow high purity crystals that come from silicon technology. Um, so that'll be a big part of it and there are a lot of other reasons as well. So having motivated the need for solar power conversion in general, um, I can now describe the photovoltaic effect in some basic terms. So what is the photovoltaic effect? Well, basically, like I said, you shine light on a device and it outputs electricity, right? Um, so the sunlight is absorbed. This is the first step because we need to be able to convert the solar energy into electrical, elect, electrical energy. So uh, we need to absorb and convert that energy first. Uh, and so that's absorption. And this is why semiconductors are used for these kinds of devices because semiconductors have what we call a band gap. And that band gap, uh, depending on the material, usually lies somewhere within the solar spectrum, right? So the solar spectrum is primarily in the visible range, in the stuff we can see, which is about one to four electron volts, and then you know there's some infrared tail to it. So one definition of a semiconductor is a insulator that has a small band gap, and because that band gap is small, it matches this solar spectrum. So basically, what we need is an occupied uh, energy level, right? So the electron is somewhere in an occupied level, and then when it absorbs light, there's some unoccupied state at an energy that matches that, that light input um, so that the electron can be promoted to that higher state. And these are what semiconductors are, one of the things that semiconductors are really good for. So as I said, the electron will be promoted from the lower state to the upper state, uh, and so that's a negative charge, something that we can use to turn into current and thus get voltage out of the device. And that unoccupied level uh, now has an electron vacancy. And that's what we call a hole. So basically, in terms of that lower state, it now misses its electron, right? So it has an effective positive charge. It feels like it's been ionized. So we can also consider the current that flows due to what we call holes, which are basically vacancies in electronic states. So an electron will flow to one electrode and the hole will flow to another electrode, and this is how we can get current to flow through a photovoltaic device and actually generate power out of it. So how do we characterize a photovoltaic cell? The same way we characterize any electrical device, is by an IV curve, right? So we apply some voltage to it, and we measure how much current comes out of it, and essentially a photovoltaic cell is a diode. So a diode is characterized by basically no current flow in one direction and then an exponential growth in the other, all right? But in this case, because of this photovoltaic effect, because it's absorbing light and generating a current simply due to that absorption of light, there is what we call a short circuit current, which is due entirely to uh, this absorption and this current flow. So at zero voltage, we can still get some current out of the device. And then as you apply a positive voltage, you'll get your diode curve. At the intersection of the uh, zero current axis, we'll get a term that we call the open circuit voltage. Um, and then also because what you really care about is power output for the device and power is current times voltage, right? So the maximum power will be at the maximum product of current and voltage somewhere along this curve, uh, illustrated by this point P here. And so if we take the, uh, basically this power divided by the maximum ideal output power, which would be the short circuit current times the open circuit voltage, then we get something called the fill factor. So basically, the more square this IV curve is in this fourth quadrant, the higher the fill factor. 
Uh, so there's basically three parameters you can use to maximize the efficiency of your solar cell. Because as you can see with these definitions in place, now we can calculate this power conversion efficiency, which is the fill factor times the VOC times the short circuit current divided by the solar input power. All right, so this is that 25% or 10% that I was talking about. So here are some examples of existing uh, solar cell technology. Uh, they're obviously useful for rooftops because otherwise they would just be absorbing sunlight and would be getting hot. So it's a good place to put some solar panels and start generating electricity. Um, they're also really good for space technology um, because you wouldn't want to have this guy, you know, you wouldn't want him to have a battery and just before he runs into ET, it dies on us, you know? So it's good to have some trans, uh, portable uh, energy source that it can carry along with it. Uh, so this has been probably the primary market for solar, solar technology at this point. Um, so kind of here's where we are right now with existing uh, solar energy. It's very low, but because of these uh, growing demands and the decrease in fossil fuel supply, uh, it is predicted to grow um, exponentially over the next you know, few decades. And this is where we are in terms of uh, cost and uh, energy efficiency. So this is the power conversion efficiency axis and then this is the cost per uh, square area. So right now this line here represents that $3.5 uh, per kilowatt hour. And then with organic and uh, other uh, disordered material photovoltaic technology, we get down in cost, although we sacrifice a little bit of efficiency, but you can extrapolate that to about one you know, dollar per kilowatt hour. And then here's where we're trying to get, right? So we can boost the efficiency while keeping the cost down. So these are two factors that we have to consider at all times. And at this point, then we'll be competitive with fossil-based fuels, and uh, it'll be a viable technology. Uh, so now I'll talk about why use organics, right? And what is, what is an organic semiconductor? So an organic semi semiconductor is based uh, primarily on carbon. So if we recall the atomic electronic configuration of carbon, we know it has six electrons, two fill the complete 1s shell, uh, two fill the 2s shell, and then we have two more in uh, 2p orbitals. But when we go to bond carbon atoms together, uh, there will be a trade-off between uh, the cost of um, the, this most stable configuration for the isolated atom and the energy cost of making bonds. So this will re result in what we call SP hybridization. So the electrons will be promoted to the P orbitals and then these form what we call uh, hybridized orbitals. They are basically mixed 2s and 2p orbitals. And then those look like this. So depending on the number of bonds that the single carbon atom makes, uh, it can either have <coughs> four sp3 uh, hybridized orbitals. Um, for three bonds, it'll be sp2 hybridized with three of these sp2 orbitals and one unpaired p orbital. And then uh, for making just two bonds, it only needs one sp orbital and it will have two lone paired uh, p orbital electrons. So then this is ethylene, uh, which basically exemplifies the sp2 hybridized orb orbital bonding, which is what pi conjugated polymers or plastic semiconductors uh, exhibit. So you see the carbon atoms make three bonds. These sp orbitals form very strong bonds. They're referred to as sigma bonds, but basically they're much more tightly localized bonds. Whereas those remaining p orbitals that we had, they form more loosely uh, detached bonds called pi bonds. So these sigma bonds make basically the backbone structure of a polymer, whereas these pi bonds are basically the valence electron. And this is what gives us semiconducting properties for, for uh, a polymer material. And then you can see here, so if you basically take two p orbitals and make them interact with each other, uh, you'll get an energy splitting, right? This is like perturbation theory from quantum mechanics. Uh, and the lower energy state will have the electronic orbitals well overlapped um, and will be lower in energy than the neutral, uh, the uninteracting state. Uh, and then there will be a, what's called a anti-bonding state where the electron uh, distributions are pushed away from each other and that is much higher in energy. And this essentially shows you where the band gap comes from in a uh, pi electron system or a conjugated polymer. Because if light comes in, we can promote an electron from this 
pi bonding orbital to this pi star anti-bonding orbital. So uh, this makes these conjugated polymers different than what we're normally used to in terms of plastics, like the things you have for spoons, uh, because they have uh, sp3 hybridized orbitals. So basically all the electrons are tied up in bonds. So they're flexible and they're good insulators and all the things we use them for, but you can't make a semiconductor out of them. Whereas these pi conjugated uh, materials, uh, since they have this one unpaired electron, that's where we get these semiconductive pro properties, something similar to what is called a valence band in a semiconductor. Um, is that finished? Okay, so uh, there's also another effect. Uh, it's more stable for these bond lengths to, instead of having equal bond lengths along the chain, for one to be shorter and one for be, and the other to be longer. It's just a more energetic, uh, stable configuration. And that's why these are represented as alternating single and double bonds, and that's called dimerization. And that actually pro pro provides another uh, energy gap. It's another contribution to the energy gap. So this all got started in about 1977 when these three fellas, Shirakawa, McDermott, and Heger, uh, showed that one of these polymers can be doped and that its electrical conductivity can change drastically upon doping. This is essentially the hallmark of a semiconductor. So if you know anything about the semiconductor industry, you know basically everything's built on P-type silicon or N-type silicon. This means that silicon is doped with either donors or uh, acceptors and allows the electron density and thus things like the conductivity to be controlled. And this is what allows us to make all these uh, electronic technology, right? It's to be able to control the electronic properties through doping. And so when these guys showed that a pi conjugated polymer could do the same, it opened the field of conducting polymers. And they were awarded the Nobel Prize for, in chemistry for this discovery in the year 2000. And if I won the Nobel Prize, I would be dancing too. So since then, uh, many variants of these pi conjugated polymers have been developed. Uh, this is kind of one of the interesting things about the field is an organic chemist can dream up a structure and if he's good enough at what he does, he can make it, and all of a sudden, it has different properties than all the others. So the field can constantly be advanced by, this, by these new materials. And this just shows you, these are the conductivities for uh, very good insulators like quartz or diamond. And then these are uh, semiconductor conductivities and metallic conductivities, which are the highest. And this is the range for conducting polymers based on their structure and also the doping level. Um, so they can be tuned essentially to metallic conductivity. And so this is the basis of an organic semiconductor. Uh, we kind of talked about this sp2 hybridization and how these bonds uh, sort of form what's equivalent to a valence band and a conduction band uh, in in semiconductor terms, right? Uh, and so some of the advantages are that we can electro we can chemically tune the electronic properties, as I've mentioned, and then also what's going to be a big advantage is that. Uh, after the polymer is created, you can just dissolve it in an organic solvent and you get something like a semiconducting ink, right? So you see these different colors, that's due to different chemical structures. I think this is MEHPPB, this is PFO, I think that's PTV, which is what I did my PhD dissertation on. But basically you can tune the colors, which means you can tune the absorption bands. And also uh, because they're basically, you make solutions out of them, you can do solution-based processing you can basically paint these on to uh, devices, and that's a lot cheaper than growing crystals onto devices, right? Um, so that's where one of the major cost advantages come from. So this shows how we make a device, it's what uh, Valley called high-tech engineering. Uh, so you start with some substrate, you pour the ink on there, uh, then usually uh, we do spin coating, which I don't know if you ever did spin art as a kid, but it's the same thing. You uh, just spin the substrate around, most of the material flies off. The stuff that stays on is smoothed out into a nice thin film, and that's how you get a thin film semiconductor, uh, semiconductor basically, uh, from these materials at least. And so you can basically repeat this process with multiple layers, and that's how you can build structure. So they've been commercialized, these semiconducting polymers, uh, in LEDs. I believe most like smartphones and uh, a lot of uh, electronic displays actually use organic LEDs now. Um, so an LED uh, is like a solar cell in reverse, which I'll show later. But basically you take uh, two electrodes, uh, 
you have an anode which would be positively charged, a cathode which would be negatively charged, and you inject charges into the material. Uh, the charges will form an exciton, which I'll explain uh, in a second. The exciton recombines and emits light, right? So that's how you basically can just turn on a voltage, drive a current through it, and get it to emit light. And because we can tune the chemical properties, we can get light at any color, right? Um, so this is a light emitting diode, and they've been commercialized because of these special advantages that come with using basically something that's in between a normal semiconductor and a flexible plastic material, right? So you can make them very thin, uh, they are very bright, and you can also make them flexible, which is good for things like touch screens and things like that. So I basically just said that. These are the advantages. They're flexible, as you can see here. They're lightweight, both because of the uh, atomic weights of the materials being used, like basically carbon and hydrogen. Um, this solution-based processing allows large area films to be fabricated very quickly, which means the production cost is potentially extremely low. Uh, and they give you very bright emission at uh, low driving voltages. Uh, they're also portable. Uh, it costs a lot to move a heavy crystalline silicon solar panel. Um, so that's another area where the cost can be reduced. But this is going to focus on solar cells, um, and that's basically an LED in reverse. So we have some light absorbing material. We use a bilayer structure. I'll explain why in a second. Uh, and in this case, we use the electrodes not to drive the charges through the material, but to extract them out. Uh, this P dot PSS is another conducting polymer. It simply functions to facilitate uh, charge transport with this electrode, which is indium tin oxide. It's a transparent conducting oxide. So basically this helps the holes get out in this case and the holes get in in that case. So the first photovoltaic was developed in 1986, uh, the first organic photovoltaic, sorry, uh, using small molecules. These are a little bit different than the polymers because they're not extended uh, very long in one dimension, but they have the basic, basically the same electronic properties and they're generally made up of carbon. Uh, the d major difference is pi-conjugated polymers are soluble, right? We can make the inks out of them. Uh, however, these are not, and they're usually formed in thin films by evaporation techniques similar to metals. But anyway, this guy, Tang, in 1986, he showed that it could be done. Uh, he got a, you know, relatively weak efficiency out of it, but you have to start somewhere. Uh, and then this basically started the bilayer structure. So this was the donor material, and this was the acceptor in his structure. And again, I'll explain how that all works in just a second. And so we have the same kind of advantages for organic photovoltaics uh, that we have for uh, organic light emitting diodes. Um, it's kind of the same thing. But one thing I haven't mentioned is transparency. So you can see a standard silicon solar array is not transparent, right? Well, this is on purpose. It's meant to absorb all the light, right? But a conducting polymer film can be made much thinner and it can be made transparent. And then you say, well, why do you want to make a transparent solar cell? You want to absorb the light. Well, you think about how we put these things on rooftops, um, but then if you think about like a skyscraper in a metropolitan city, it's all windows, right? And it's actually so bright uh, and it gets so hot because of all the sunlight pouring in through skyscrapers that they are forced to tint them to some 30 or 40 percent just so it's bearable for the workers to be in there. So you can imagine replacing that useless tint with a uh, organic conducting uh, photovoltaic tint, now all of a sudden you're powering the building uh, with these kinds of materials. So this is actually what I worked on a lot as a, a PhD student, was making transparent solar arrays for uh, solar window technology. Um, and as I said, these materials, uh, this field is advanced by the development of new materials. So these uh, Materials like poly 3 hexylthiophene came along and the efficiencies were boosted. Uh, it also relies a lot on a soluble version of C60 or what's known as the Buckman Buckminster fullerene uh, or buckyball. Uh, so this is our main electron acceptor. So this is Buckminster Fuller. If you don't know about this guy, Google him. He's a really interesting character. He was like an architect, an inventor, a poet, um, all kinds of things. He got expelled from Harvard twice and then ended up lecturing there. So anyway, Google, he's really cool. Uh, also, the guy who synthesized C60, Sir Harold Proto, um, was influenced by uh, Buckminster Fuller's architect, especially the geodesic dome, uh, in developing his design. 
And Sir Harold Crodo is also a really interesting character, and you should Google him when I'm done, too. Um, so now to the basic working principles of organic solar cells. So as I said, we have this thing called an exciton, right? So now I'm um, using the term uh, highest occupied molecular orbital. So this is basically somewhere in between the uh, pi bonding orbital and the valence band. Um, it's not the pi bonding orbital because we have lots of electrons, right? Because we have a long carbon chain. And it's not a valence band because we don't have a really crystalline material. We don't have the density of states that a semiconductor does. But anyway, when light comes in, uh, the electron will be promoted from the highest occupied molecular orbital to the lowest unoccupied molecular orbital. And this forms an electron here and leaves a hole there. Uh, but there's a Coulomb binding energy, right? This is negatively charged, this is positively charged. So they're bound together by these Coulomb forces. And because they're bound together, this is a short-lived species, it will recombine. And that recombination is actually how the LEDs work, because when it recombines, it can emit light. Um, but because it happens very fast, uh, it limits the amount that this exciton is going to be able to move around in a photovoltaic device. So this next slide sort of talks about that more. Uh, it'll decay in a, on a nanosecond time scale, or sometimes hundreds of picoseconds, and it can emit light, giving rise to photoluminescence or electroluminescence in a device structure. And it can also recombine non-radiatively, basically by dissipating heat. Um, so these are loss mechanisms for a photovoltaic device, because what we want to do is we want to get this electron out, and we want to get this hole out, and we want to drive them into uh, some sort of power source, right? Um, so we need to dissociate the exciton uh, before it recombines. That is, we need to break the binding energy between these two carriers in order to extract these as charges. So that's where this bilayer structure comes in, this donor and acceptor material comes in. So uh, this shows a device structure, but it's plotted on an energy scale. So this is the work function of indium tin oxide. This is basically where the holes have to get to in order to be passed into your toaster. And then this is the same for electrodes, where we use a low work function material like aluminum. And so light comes in, it creates an exciton, uh, and now the electron can be transferred to the acceptor system. And that's how we can dissociate the exciton. And now we have a relatively free hole left here in the, uh, the homo of the donor and a relatively free electron in the lumo of the acceptor. And then they can make their way to the opposite charges. This is why we need a donor accept acceptor system for organic photovoltaics. Uh, and so in 1992, you notice the guy Heger, same guy who got the prize, right? Uh, his group discovered that this happens uh, between what was actually at that point C60 um, and a pi conjugated polymer, but it also happens, so PCBM is C60, but it just has this uh, extra group, and that makes it soluble so that we can do solution process, you know, solution processing, uh, but that's the only difference. But this is an ultra-fast process, it occurs within 40, second, 40 femtoseconds, which is really fast, and that means it's really efficient and it outcompetes all the radio uh, recombination pathways for the exciton, right? So this will happen before it emits photons or before it dissipates into heat. So this is how an organic photovoltaic works. Um, but now, uh, what you might realize, if we go back a second, is because of that short exciton diffusion length, this is only going to happen right at the interface, right? Uh, if uh, an exciton is formed way over here, it's not going to make it. It only gets to move about 5 nanometers before it recombines. And it's not going to make it here, and we're going to lose it. So uh, after we have absorbed light and we've created an exciton, um, then we can get this charge generation at the donor acceptor interface. Uh, but we're limited by the surface area between these two materials. So these guys in 1995 or 6 came up with the idea of the bulk heterojunction structure which means now we're going to take the two materials and mix them together, and now we have one solution, and we're just going to make a film out of this one blend solution. And what this will do is it will create um, basically an interpenetrating network. So now we have the buckyballs and the polymers all mixed together. So now we have interface everywhere, right? Interface is all the way throughout the film. And this greatly enhances the charge generation, because now we're not losing any excitons through recombination. Um, the trade-off, though, is we want to be able to transport these charges to the electrodes, and now we don't have these nice pathways 
of electrons to go through the acceptor and holes to go uh, through the donor, uh, now they have to hop around and hopefully find a magical per percolation pathway through the disordered material. So it's a bit of a trade-off, but this is actually a lot more efficient in terms of power conversion efficiency than the bilayer structure. Uh, this is a really complicated slide about the bulkhead or junction. I'll move past that. Uh, this just shows some device cross section. Um, so this would be that blend layer, right? So there's PCBM and a polymer called MDMO PPD all mixed together in there. Uh, and so the last step, since now we've generated these charges, like I said, is to transport them and collect them. And so there's charge carrier recombination especially in the bulkhead or junction blend because basically if uh, you have a charge transfer so now you have a hole over here on a polymer and you have an electron over here on PCBM well I guess well, there's another you know hole and electron right over here because there's two other materials so it's really easy for this hole now to recombine with that electron and all this stuff so you get charge carrier recombination and then the other problem is that these are generally disordered materials which means uh, say compared to like crystalline silicon or a metal, the charges just don't move as fast through the material. And that's what we talk about, the charge carrier mobility is much lower in these materials. But some of the advancements through, uh, through chemical structure allow for higher mobilities, and that's one of the reasons that this uh, regioregular P3HT became so famous, because it has a very high mobility, and that's how it, one of the reasons it allowed a mar large boost in sort of photovoltaic efficiency. Um, and then, so now there's all kinds of people working on how to optimize this bulkhead or junction structure, right? Because you have this really complicated thing that we call nanomorphology, which is basically the arrangement of the polymers with respect to the PCBM. Um, because basically, at some point in time, you get so much charge generation, but you lose transport. Uh, if you're in the bilayer structure, you lose charge generation, but you have good transport. So the idea is how can you uh, tailor uh, both the the chemical properties of the material and the nanomorphology of the bulkhead or junction layer to optimize both. All right. And so this is uh, an art in itself, uh, a field in itself, the bulkhead or junction nanomorphology. Uh, and people do all kinds of things, uh, what Professor Ardeni has referred to as black magic, because it really is. I mean, someone, you like, you didn't like sit down and think, oh, this will definitely work. You just tried it and it worked and then uh, you published it or whatever. But, uh, <laughs> So, um, you know, they look at, uh, you know, AFM images and things like that to show the uh, difference between phase segregation between the bi-component materials and, and things like that. Uh, so thermal annealing, uh, you just heat the film up and then you let it cool down and all of a sudden it's got a better nanomorphology for photovoltaics. There's also something called solvent annealing where you basically expose it to an organic solvent vapor. All kinds of tricks that people pull um, to optimize this morphology. And, and therefore the device uh, efficiency. Uh, so this shows that it works, you anneal it, you get, uh, what is it, you had 0.5%, you anneal it, now all of a sudden you get much greater current, a better fill factor, and you, with that, get six times, five or six times the power conversion efficiency out of it by tailoring this nanoscale uh, morpho morphology of the bulkhead or junction layer. Um, and so basically they're trying to find some way to achieve this uh, where you have a lot of donor acceptor interface, but you have continuous pathways for charge transport uh, for electrons uh, to the cathode or low work function electrode and holes uh, to the anode. Uh, but the thing is, if you could find some way to do this, you have to keep, keep in mind it's got to be low cost, right? You can't go reinventing the silicon solar cell or you're right back where you started. So that's why you have to use these tricks like heating it or exposing it to vapors and that sort of stuff. Or, People add stuff to the solvents. It has to be a solution processable way to achieve this paradigm. Uh, very difficult work, and I'm glad that I didn't do it. Uh, so yeah, we're coming to the end. Uh, this is um, how they're fabricated um, and the things that are kept in mind, as I just said. You want to boost the efficiency. If you can't make it efficient, it's not worth doing. Uh, you want it to live a long time, because if, it, if it's efficient but doesn't last, you know, um, then it won't be worth doing for a very long time. And also, you want it to be cheap, uh, otherwise no one's going to pay for it. Right. So this is cost per watt peak, which is basically just the maximum power output and how much it costs uh, to get that kilowatt power or whatever it is. 
So one way to boost the efficiency is you have to optimize this absorption band edge with the solar spectrum. Right? So you can see the early polymers like MDMO PPV had band edges around 600 nanometers or so and they collected very little of the solar spectrum. Uh, but as I said, this can be engineered uh, by changing the chemical structure. And so now a big drive is what are called low band gap polymers. So they push the absorp absorption edge further over here and they collect a lot more of the solar emission spectrum. Um, and so that's how these efficiencies like 10% have now been achieved using these so-called low band gap polymers. Uh, however, there's always a trade-off, right? Um, you have a low band gap polymer here and you see, oh, it absorbs 800 to 600 very well, but now you're losing that high energy component. Um, so you, you can't have it all, right? Uh, or uh, if you want to have it all, you've got to use it all. Um, so now what we can do is we can use multiple materials as absorbing structures. Um, so this shows what's called a Forster Resonant Energy Transfer Cascade. I don't know if you know what Forster Energy, energy Transfer is, but basically there's two requirements. One, the acceptor has to have a lower band gap than the donor and they have to be close enough together. And then what happens is, okay, the big band gap material, like this uh, green chromophore here, absorbs the light and then it simply passes it down, uh, passes the electron down to its neighbor with a smaller band gap. So if you were able to engineer these multi-colored uh, chromophores, you know, with different absorption band gaps and get them close enough, then you could absorb all of the light very efficiently because this one absorbs and passes it to its neighbor. This one absorbs and passes it to its neighbor and so forth and so on. And then you pass them to the donor acceptor interface and uh, turn them into charges. Um, yeah, so it says inspired by photosynthesis, except I think photosynthesis has like 237 of these or something like that. Um, the other thing is you can just basically take two photovoltaics and stack them on top of each other and it's called a tandem cell. Uh, so you'd have one material that absorbs the, the low energy side and one material that absorbs the high energy side and then you make this tandem structure uh, so you basically have one bottom solar cell and one top solar cell and then you need a recombination layer right because uh, electrons are going to flow this way from this solar cell but then the holes are going to flow this way and electrons are going to flow this way so you need some area where those two can recombine and cancel each other out um, and what you can do here is you can get more current now because you're absorbing the whole solar spectrum and also because you're stacking devices in series you can actually get more voltage right because voltage adds in series um, and then uh, the question of stability and lifetime I have no idea how this cartoon is supposed to symbolize that but uh, it is a important issue um, so there are many degradation pathways for organics uh, including uh, the fact that these materials are very sensitive to oxygen and moisture um, so oxygen can come in and uh, under the presence of light it can result in photooxidation, which ties up electrons and reduces the efficiency. Um, water, it's also very sensitive to water. Um, and then at the contacts you can get aluminum oxide which forms and this actually blocks electron transport out. Um, and then the, the uh, electrode materials like aluminum on this side or indium can actually diffuse in and damage the material as well. So lots of ways for this to go wrong. The most important though are really the diffusion of oxygen and moisture in. So there's a lot of ongoing work of encapsulation. Uh, basically you just have to make this structure in a uh, controlled environment like a nitrogen environment which there are um, hundreds in the basement, well, not hundreds, there's like 10 downstairs in the basement. And uh, then you seal it with some, uh, some kind of plastic or something like that. Except normal plastics won't do. Uh, they don't keep out the oxygen and water nearly well enough. Um, so there are better packaging materials, but basically we, we need to do a really good job of uh, keeping this stuff out so that we can make it last. But people have done this. Uh, so this is a patented technology uh, by Nova Plasma Inc. Um, they are able to keep it flexible because that's one important thing. I mean, you can sandwich it between a couple pieces of glass and glue it together and everything like that, but then you lose this flexibility. Uh, that makes them so attractive. Um, but they realized how to do it with a flexible layer. Uh, it's patented, so I couldn't find out that much about it. But this basically compares what I'm guessing are unencapsulated uh, device statistics, which decay very quickly, uh, compared to their encapsulated devices, which show some decay, uh, which might be due to some of those other processes like the 
metal uh, ion diffusion, but uh, obviously lasts for a much longer time. Um, in fact, in over a year, it decays less than 25%. So we're getting cl pretty close to where this could be a viable technology in terms of the lifetime stability. Um, so the cost uh, is, I think, mainly driven down by the solution processing based techniques, and there are several of them. Uh, so what you can do is you can basically glob the material on and then use a blade to kind of smooth it out. Uh, I talked about spin coating. Uh, in my PhD work, we actually did spray coating to make large area sol solar window arrays. Um, so basically any way that you can paint something um, or do some kind of industrial coating process, you can use to make these kinds of electronic devices, which means you can do large area very quickly and uh, it costs a lot less. So here's Heger again showing his flexible large area array. Um, and then this other concept is roll to roll. So it's kind of the same thing, large area very quickly. But you can imagine having a big roll of a plastic substrate on one end, and then it rolls to another, uh, plas you know, another roll of plastic over here, and you're just feeding it continuously between the two rolls. You're doing all your processing in the middle, and so it's basically just like a factory producing photovoltaics very quickly. Um, and now, so for some of the advantages and challenges, uh, the indium tin oxide uh, substrate, people want to get rid of that because indium is a very limited resource and it's expensive. Uh, so there's a lot of work on uh, things like nanotubes. So you have to meet the requirements of the electrode being transparent and uh, simultaneously they're trying to make it solution processable, right? Because indium tin oxide, uh, one, it, it's a crystal, you have to grow it. Uh, or you can sputter it or something, but you have to have the crystalline material to begin with. And the other thing is it's not very flexible. So not only can we reduce the cost, but maybe add some, some flexibility through that electrode. And carbon nanotubes have high transmittance, which means they'll be good as a transparent electrode to allow the sunlight in. Uh, and they can be developed from solution-based processes. And if people are also using uh, silver nanowires for the same process, same, same reason. Uh, this shows that it works, uh, comparing a indium tin oxide electrode to a nanotube electrode, they can get relatively uh, similar performance, uh, so that's a, a good step in the right direction. Um, and then also to improve the efficiency, uh, there's these concepts of multiple carrier generation. This actually comes from semiconductor quantum dots, but there's a similar effect in pi conjugated polymers, which is called singlet fission. But basically the idea is if you absorb high energy light with twice the energy of the band gap of the material, you can get two carriers out of that. Um, so I'm running out of time, I can't really explain it in too much detail, but it has been demonstrated for these uh, quantum dots and also for pi conjugated polymers, not only as a physical process that happens, but it's been used to get uh, efficiencies that when divided by the number of absorbed photons are higher than 100%. So they're actually getting more electrons out than photons are being absorbed. So it has been demonstrated uh, relatively recently. So there are ways of boosting the efficiency. Uh, it depends on the band gap, I'll gloss over that. And then this is an outdated slide showing where organic photovoltaics are in comparison to the relative technologies. The more updated slide has so many devices on it though you can't even see what's going on. Uh, but these are all, um, highly crystalline, single crystalline materials, and this is also using uh, multi-junctions and solar concentration and things like that. Uh, but as you see, we started very low, we're on our way up, we're actually closer to here now, about 10%, and we're doing it with a lot less uh, input cost than it takes uh, to get up here using crystalline semiconductors. Um, so the efficiency can still grow, um, and that's one thing that people are working on. Uh, one main limiting factor is this low mobility from disordered materials, as I said. Um, and, but there's always the potential for chemists to develop new materials and therefore boost the efficiency or boost the mobi mobility. Um, and then improving the efficiency in lifetime. Um, and now we've come to the summary. Uh, so these are uh, very interesting technology because they can be low cost, lightweight, flexible, uh, transparent, all these different properties that silicon photovoltaics don't have. Um, and uh, yeah, mainly can reduce that cost per kilowatt hour efficiency. Uh, that's so important.
So acknowledgments, uh, this is prof uh, Professor Vardeni would like to acknowledge his former students, Josh Holt and Xiaomei Zhang, my uh, advisor at the University of South Florida, Victor Klimov at uh, Los Alamos National Lab, uh, he's the Quan Dot guy, he probably provided those slides, and then other uh, collaborators of Dr. Vardeni's, um, Sarista Fisti in Austria, near Tesla in Israel, and, and Barzaki Doff at UT Dallas. And with that, I'll conclude, and I'll thank you for your, your attention.